LTA said simply go and Singaporean said simply no and therefore we have this episode tonight. So welcome everyone to episode 75 of Tetarik with Walid. And as you all know, the recent controversy over the news supposedly was supposed to be introduced. I mean, it still is going to be introduced, the, the simply go uh, issue it generated a lot of buzz online it generated a lot of discussions and not least not least from our our two guests between our two guests i i would say i should say uh, professor walter tasera and engineer both are friends of the show they have both been on before and uh, they were debating this issue online as well the context is Walter when Professor Walter Tessera went on CNA's podcast and there was a clip of his that went viral and then Angie responded to him online and there was a little back and forth between them. So I thought, you know, there's only one way to settle this, right? And that is to come on Tetare with Wallet and let's have uh, this discussion and let's stretch it out. Uh, and I think both of them were spotting enough to accept this invitation. So I will be an impartial moderator today. So we will see. Well, somewhat. So I I feel Hi. a little I I feel a little bit uh, like the UN Secretary General, you know, bringing two warring parties together. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> why why are we warring parties? I, mean, uh... I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it seems uh, it seems so. So actually, that that is interesting, right? So. Uh, so uh, maybe uh, Walter, you wanna kick us off. So what what yeah, exactly okay. went viral, or how how exactly did it go viral? You know, I I can't really explain how it went viral, but I guess uh, the issue here is that uh, uh, whatever portion of the clip uh, that people decided to extract basically hit all the right tropes for a lot of people, right? And and the tropes are basically um, here we have an elitist, out of touch policy maker who is uh, completely unable to comprehend why uh, the common people don't understand why the policy that they have devised is actually for their own good. And I will freely admit uh, that actually, um, looking back in the situation, and also uh, looking at what LTA has since disclosed in terms of its decision-making process, what it has done before, uh, the rollout of, of you know this um, cancellation of EV Link and so on, I will have to admit that I don't think I would have done anything differently. Because when I look at what they've done, they did everything by the book, actually. They did a public consultation. They actually uh, had a trial with people, you know, adapting Simply Go. And they didn't see anything alarming from all of that to tell them that this would be a complete disaster. They really didn't, right? And so, you know, to be perfectly honest, it was actually hard for me to, uh, to fault them given what they have but of course given how it was rolled out then of course you can bring out all the breakbacks now and then say you know how all there are all these little things that they didn't consider in terms of the user experience stakeholders and so on so all the, i think all that is fair enough but i just want to be clear about it that um yeah you know if i represent the out of touch policy maker that is very much the case i didn't really foresee uh that people would be so you know concerned about the simply go transition right. line. Okay, so just just to clarify, so Walter is no longer in Parliament. He's no longer a nominated member of Parliament. To do with and he didn't. He had, yes, that was what I was going to say. <laughs> he had nothing to do. He's not from LTA, so yeah. he was invited to be uh, on that podcast, uh, which uh, NG took issue with that particular clip. So, NG, what's your problem basically? Um, I just want to clarify, right? It wasn't just that particular clip. I listened right, right. to the entire podcast. Okay. So. Um, I think when I, I, okay, and also to be fair, right? Like uh, I'm, I've already transitioned to simply go, not because I wanted to, but because I was forced to when my EasyLink card expired and I couldn't get like you know my cash back. I, I had to switch to a different card to transfer my remaining credit, right? So I've been using it for a couple of months, and then um, and I would say that you know I don't love it. I could live with it. It's a tolerable state of annoyance that I just lived with. Okay, so. Um, so when, when they announced the change, I was like, okay, yeah, well, everyone's going to grumble, but we'll, we'll just get over it. And then I saw the clip uh, featuring Professor Walter, and then I just thought it was really, really funny. Um, because the way that he talked about policymakers, and also himself, because you included yourself, right? I was just like, oh my god, this is like comic gold, you know? Like, I just have to 
make a comic account. Why? What? 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 What was funny about it? Um, it's just a level of um, a lack of, of awareness, <laughs> obliviousness to the the plight of the ordinary people and the way that you're just like, oh, you know, I only take. Public transport when yeah. it's inconvenient to drive, and I was like, "Oh my god, I need, I need to draw this right." Uh, and thanks for being so sporting. Like I, I, I was talking to you afterwards, yeah. and I, I did clarify yeah. that it's not meant to be a hit piece on you per se, uh, maybe a little bit, but uh, I think it's it's more reflective of the general mindset, maybe of the people who put out uh, policies or you know new systems, and they don't particularly use them, use it themselves. And then, okay, now let yeah. Let's save the niceties for later. <laughs> okay, but, but you know, I, I, yes, I think yeah, actually, yeah. What, yeah. what I regret, right? I, I think yeah. what I do regret is that it was a missed opportunity, and I think I, I see this quite clearly, like, clearly, like in the discussion we're having. It's actually a, a seriously, uh, unfortunately, a missed opportunity for me to convey to as many people as possible both why uh, policymakers and actually I'm going to argue here a significant number of Singaporeans, maybe even you know, one third or more, actually genuinely think Simply Go is better for them, as well as convey okay, why there's also a significant number of Singaporeans who are extremely unhappy with it. So I probably failed to do both of them uh, justice and that is actually the real regret I have. I mean, yeah, you, you can Make fun of me. I think that's okay. It's not as if I like that, but you know, that, that's like that's like that's one thing, right? But I think the more regrettable thing is that people still don't understand why many Singaporeans like Simply Go, and they also don't understand why many Singaporeans uh, just cannot deal with it. Both of these things, I think, are still not understood very well. And in fact, I think, unfortunately, ever since the announcement to cancel uh, the transition or whatever has gone forth, I will tell you, there's now actually a backlash from the people who like Simply Go, who are now asking, why are we spending money to, you know, uh, to retain it when we just don't understand why some Singaporeans hate it? You see, so, so clearly both sides don't understand each well, other. Well, I mean, what, people what like Kelvin it, Ching have already said that the people who want EasyLink should put the bill for it. it well, right. they're not yeah, I, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw I saw that. But so so uh Walter, what would you have said? What okay, would you I have mean, said? I think it's not so much what I say, it's maybe it's just the way I say it. I guess it wasn't very uh you know, it wasn't very clear or it wasn't very empathetic. But okay, I mean just, just starting from the point of view, right, of uh the people who actually really do like the existing system. I think it is it is very hard, I think, for people who are actually not in that group. To understand why it is actually such a big deal for them uh, to move to a system where they cannot see the account balances easily so that's one thing and also it's very difficult for that group to consider using uh, a bank card sometimes because they are unbanked or they haven't transitioned to contactless cards other times because they're reasonably fearful of using their card in a way that could to them you know result in huge deductions or something like that when they don't have much in their bank account and I think I did not uh, convey correctly or appropriately basically the challenge of that group actually faces. And to be clear, uh, the reason why I consider that a big policy problem, policy failure, you might say, is that we should not have a public transport system in Singapore where any Singaporean, especially this group, has to worry about dollars and cents when taking public transport. To me, this is actually an absolute tragedy. Uh, the reason why I say it's a tragedy is that I just think about all of the decisions that some people in the group have to make on a daily basis where maybe they don't make the decision because they're worried about spending an extra 30 or 40 cents or whatever, right? So, so just think about uh, maybe they think, oh, I have to walk uh, the distance of one MRT station and one bus stop because can I really afford this extra couple of cents? There are going to be some people in the group who think that way. And this is actually a tragedy, right? Why should we have behavior like this in a first world country? So the first thing I would say is I did not convey the gravity of the situation that uh, that that group basically faces. Okay, then moving on to the policymakers, I also didn't convey, and this is in part because, frankly, LTA didn't release a lot of information at the time about what they had done. Uh, you know, to try to figure this out. But you know, I didn't. I think quite convey that at the end of the day, uh, policymakers are generally trying to do the best they can with the constraints they have, right? And one of the constraints here with Simply Go and the transition is that you have a system at the end of life. If you want to 
renew the system and maintain it, that's going to take taxpayer money. And that means going, trying to figure out, okay, well, um, uh, do, does it mean that, you know, we have to tell the public we're going to be spending more money on this and why? And so I think for them, it was a very natural thing to plan to sunset the old system. They also did their homework in trying to contact people, get feedback and so on. And, and they apparently, they didn't learn anything alarming from that. Again, I wasn't there, I don't know, but you know, this appears to be the case. And in the end, they made a decision that they thought was simply a technical problem, right? A technical problem, in other words, uh, sim uh, EasyLink is ending. We don't want to spend more taxpayer money on this. We did the test and people seem to be okay transiting, so we're going to transit. And the policymakers didn't foresee it would turn out to be a to complete political disaster. They didn't foresee that. Um, and yeah, but I didn't, I think I didn't convey, you know, how that went either la, appropriately. So that's my regret, right. okay. I suppose. Thank you. Thank you. That was very clear. Angie, I saw you smiling throughout. Yeah. Uh, well, can I just point out, like, I think Please. a lot of the backlash that you got as well is the fact that you keep focusing on the low income group. And we all understand, you know, like these are people who do need to see their bank balances. They are very concerned about how much they spend. And, and you know, I, 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 I do love how you are very concerned about like how public transport is maybe not affor affordable for them where they do have to worry about this thing. But then you're entirely disregarding the whole group of people like me who, you know, don't have to worry about our bank accounts. But our subjective experience is like far less worse than when we were using EaseLink just because there's a lot more cognitive like load that, that's on us right now. You know, in the past, I just tapped out. I look at my fare, I look up at my balance. I don't have to think about it anymore. Now I tap out. I still have to remember like, oh, okay, I need to check. I need to oh, take out my phone, open the app, check the fare balance. And then, you know, if I'm lazy, I don't check it for two weeks. If there's a mistake, I can't, I can't like, you know, tell them, hey, um, you made a mistake. I need a refund. You know, and, and so you're, you're, you're giving me extra things to do and then telling me, hey, it's an upgrade, you know, this is so much better. It's so streamlined. We've like up, upgraded the technology. And I think that's what a lot of people are annoyed about. I think most of us would eventually just get used to it. But just to tell us that, hey, it's an upgrade because it's an upgrade on your part um, is, I think, what a lot of people are annoyed sure. with. No, no, yeah. it's also, I think having uh, seeing you explain that is actually very useful because I'll be frank, that, that is actually a group that I didn't tackle. But I'll tell you why I didn't tackle it, right? Because fundamentally, what we have here is the difference between whether your baseline is, do you trust that the system more or less works on average reasonably well and it's not out to, you know, screw you over or at least it's not designed so ineptly, shall we say, that uh, you often end up making a mistake or the system ends up deducting more than it should, it's going quite often, right? Versus the view that, uh, well, the system works as design and because it works as design, this is not something I have a lot of uh, stress over in terms of whether it does or doesn't deduct me uh, more than it should. Because when you look at Simply Go, right, there are, okay, to be clear, there are two groups of people uh, who are using Simply Go. There's the group of people like yourself who appear to be, correct me if I'm wrong, right? But I think what you're doing is you're using a card with a virtual wallet balance on it uh, rather than using, let's say, your bank card or something like that. And then there are people who use their bank cards in Simply Go, which is about 40%. Um, I am going to wager that quite a significant chunk of that 40% using their bank cards uh, hardly check their exact transactions. Now, of course, if you go and check them, they may, like yourself or like other people have heard about, be horrified to find that, you know, there are some uh, incorrect transactions and so on. Although I want to be clear here that I have no idea what the percentage is. It's just that when people do find this out, of course, they post about it because they are understandably very upset. They're very I aggrieved. I think um, there's a PQ yeah. that was like yeah. raised and right. we will find it oh, out yeah. in yeah, Parliament. Yeah, that would be good. Yeah, exactly. But, but what I want to point out here, right, is that when you look at account-based systems uh, elsewhere, actually a lot of them work on the same basis as this. They work on the basis that um, most of the users have to be comfortable with trusting that the system doesn't screw up most of the time, you see? Uh, but one of the ways that they build that trust, I have to say, is not so much with, you know, this system of uh, using the app to check whether you're deducted correctly, which I think is actually not that great of a system. People have told me that and I accept that. Uh, I think one of the ways they build this trust is by designing the fair schedules and so on so that people don't feel 
that the system has some kind of element in there that's out to get you in some way. So I'll give you one example, right? Transport for London. Transport for London uh, has a uh, account-based system as well, where if you use the account-based system, it's also very hard for you to see what you're being charged for a particular ride. But the reason why people are okay with that, I think, is that the authorities have designed into the system uh, quite a comprehensive fare cap system. And the way the fare cap system works is that for people who are relying on public transport, they never pay more than the fare they would pay otherwise if they wanted to buy a concession pass of some type. It's, uh, yeah, so, so that's the way the fare cap system is implemented. So why is that a useful feature? Because it means that basically it's very hard for the system to screw up and charge you too much, you know, because right. once you reach the fare limit, which is set, I think, quite low because it's meant to, you know, uh, ensure people can afford the system, then that's it, right? I mean, even if the system doesn't work properly after that, you're not going to pay more than that amount. And I think in Singapore, unfortunately, we have this legacy system. I'll say, all right, we have a legacy system where in the past we tried to use prices to make people choose between different kinds of transport in different ways, which was not good, I think, for their sanity or for the system's efficiency. So one example is, you know, I mean, some of you are not old enough for this, but uh, in the past, there were aircon buses and there were non-aircon buses. And of course, aircon buses had a surcharge. Now, you know, you could argue aircon buses are more expensive to operate, but my point is these kinds of fare differentials are pain in the ass. And uh, if people who remember that these fare differentials exist, I can understand why they're very annoyed with uh, how the system works and how they're trying to watch whether the system's trying to, you know, throw them over or something like that. But we've been trying to design away from these kinds of fare differentials. And I would argue we should probably go a lot further. So perhaps the last thing I'll say on this briefly is that uh, one thing I will agree with and I will actually argue is that Simply Go is probably not the right system for the fair system that we have today. It will be the right system, I think, if we much more aggressively move on fair caps, uh, if we present automatic subsidies to people who are in the right categories based on their income, you know, age, whatever it is, and we basically generally release Singaporeans of having to worry about, is it $1, 150 140 what it is? Because these kinds of worries don't have a place, I think, in our public transport system. If I go to the train station, right, or whatever, I just want to think, oh, how do I go from A to B? That's it. I don't want people to think, well, but is it going to cost this or this? That's a kind of a waste of time. So, you know, what I'm trying to say is the way to deal with your concern, I think, is can I make it so that nobody has to worry about their balance and whether the fare is going to cost this and this? Because that would be the ideal to me. I just I, I think a system where you can monitor your balance very carefully is worse than one where uh, I've kind of designed away the need for you even to worry about this because it's not going to be consequential. Yeah. Ah, okay. So so that's interesting. The the final uh, sentence you just mentioned. So I also read. I mean, you've made this point before, Walter. I read in. Professor Lim Sansan's your fellow NMP during uh, during your term. I read her op-ed yesterday, and she was arguing that the main issue is trust in the system. And I'm not sure whether is it that deep you think, or is it just a sim simple matter of what Ng said. People just want to see the balance when you when you draw money from the bank, right? You just want to see the balance, especially if you're going to change to a new system. You would mm -hmm. expect that the new system would be as as informative as the previous system, right? Is that really? Did we really need to go deeper and say that this is a lack of trust in the system? I think there's is it a lot of trust issues here. Oh, you think uh, so? Can I just, no, just I, I, jump I, I, in? Yeah, please, sorry, go ahead, go please, ahead. please yeah. Angie. Yeah. Oh, I, I think like the other thing is just that like in Singapore, we are, I think most of us, even for the people who like to complain a lot, uh, expect things to just work, right? And um, EasyLink was working real well, you know, because we could see the fair and balance. And then when you switch to a new upgrade, we would expect it to also just work for a majority of the, the commuters, right? So I think um, because we are so used to efficiency and we are so used to having price transparency, like then when it, it is taken away, that particular thing, then it, it doesn't feel like an upgrade. It feels like a downgrade. And I would say that it objectively is a downgrade because I love what you're saying about having, you know, fair caps and stuff, but realistically for that to go through parliament and get passed for all the subsidies and whatnot for people, I don't know when that's going to be, man. And then while that's, while people are fighting for that to happen, we are all still 
having to deal with the current system. So I don't know if being idealistic is nice, but also we are we are the ones, you know, going through it every day for I don't know how many more years before subsidies come into play or fair caps. Mm. Yeah. So, so maybe just briefly on, on the trust issue. I, I, so, so I think what's interesting is I, I thought about this and, you know, it's actually kind of interesting that today we even trust the cash card system because I think we have to remember that before cash cards, we had magnetic, uh, you know, stripe cards. But even before that, of course, we paid with cash. Lah. So again, um, I think a lot of your know, listeners will, don't re- will not remember this, but <laughs> we used to pay with cash last time. And although I was also too young back then to remember what people were saying when we transitioned with cash to the magnetic cards and so on, I wouldn't be surprised at all if a lot of people were not happy with transitioning to the magnetic cards and then later if you like. Why not happy? Because when you got cash, when you pay your public transport of cash of course you keep all the cash in your wallet right so it's right. yours and then you're told one day hey uh, the government wants you to first put ten dollars or twenty dollars into this card then only you can take public transport of course a lot of people are going to be like yeah. what the heck man and of course to get people to do that okay the government used everybody's favorite tool which was prices uh, it became quickly apparent that it would be more expensive to pay cash fares than to pay uh, magnetic card fares right and so that's how they got people to shift their money into these cards which then became evening cards eventually but if you think about that there is no logical reason why anybody would if you were concerned about trust right there's no logical reason why anybody would prefer paying with the card instead of paying with cash out of your wallet except of course with the convenience but if you're really worried about your money going missing and i'm sure there were people coming up with conspiracy theories back then uh you know about how the government you know wanted extra money in your cards locked away and, and stuff like that right i wouldn't be surprised social media wasn't a thing obviously back then but you know my, my point is people would have reasons to be suspicious of the system and yet decades later we are now at a situation where ironically everybody completely trusts the cash cards, even though it's not the same exactly as money in your wallet, but everybody completely trusts it at the moment. We have somehow managed to create a lot of trust in that. And of course, that's when uh, going to a different system, understandably, people think, well, what the heck is this? Because it doesn't offer me the same features as the cash card uh, system. But I think the other aspect of trust I do uh, worry about it and also a bit concerned about is that um, I do think looking at some of the discussion online, you know, some of the posts and so on, that I think there's a, there are a number of people who criticize the transition in the system without fully knowing what it is that they were criticizing. And I'm not here going to talk about people who use EasyLink cards or even, uh, you know, like um, virtual wallets with uh, Simply Go cards. Who I'm really talking about here are the people who use bank cards uh, under Simply Go and don't even know that they're using Simply Go. There are definitely people out there who use their bank cards every day, who didn't check their statements, I suspect, and who were happy to bandwagon onto the criticism of Simply Go because, you know, to them, it's like, oh, government's trying to do something funny again. And to be fair, right, the way that the announcement was made, the very short timeline, six months only, very little explanation, I think, given at that point in time, although more stuff came out later, that would give a lot of people room for pause, right? And so some people, I think, bandwagon on. And ironically, some of those people, I think, came to regret their choices, the bandwagon, because those people later found out, oh, now we've got to pay $40 billion more for not going ahead of this. And I was actually using Simply Go all the, I was using Simply Go anyway, and it actually worked for me. So, so people right. didn't understand what it is that they were complaining right. about. But again, I'm not referring to the people using EasyLink cards, you know, as well as, as you know, the people who have got quite well reasoned out concerns for why they just don't like Simply Go. Like, I mean, those are, I think, are, are very sensible. Right. So, so just just to pick on what you said, I pick up on what you said. Uh, you mentioned that probably during the transition from cash to EasyLink, I can imagine I would have. I was also quite young, but I would have complained as well. I just don't like the the entire shift to everything cashless. It just it's just difficult for me. I'm a bit old school. But the government persisted anyway, right? What is different this time, right? What is different this time? And Angie, do you feel like that's a win? That's a win for the citizens. The fact that okay, people, like, you were complaining, I, and then the government. You know, I, I feel like I should be channeling all the all the diehard Easy Link Go like fans, right? <laughs> but to be honest, I, I don't I don't think that this is a good move forward. I would rather they spend that forty million trying to figure out how to get Easy uh, Simply Go 
um, show the fair imbalances. I mean, they did say that there are like calculational problems and it will take a couple of seconds, which would then, you know, like clog up the system. But, you know, I would rather money be poured into that rather than to like, you know, extend the, the dying lifeline of a system that we are going to have to sunset anyways in like a, a few years, I guess. Um, so I would, I would much rather that. Um, but at the same time, I think that the transition period given was too short. Like, uh, I think I was reading a reports about how like the system was like not loading very well or there were problems when people wanted to upgrade and then the transit link machines were not working properly. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, they could probably have extended it by a little bit, but I don't think they should have spent 40 mil to, to do well, so. so. It's, it seems like it's them if they do, them if they don't. So, uh, uh, I mean, people are complaining and then people are saying, like, like yourself are saying that. Because I uh, think oh. the, 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 key, the key part is that we want to see the balance and we want to see the fair. And you could, if you could do that with the new system, then we would be fine with it. Like, right. it's not about easy link versus right, right, right. It's about, I want to see the right. money, it, you know? It's, yeah. a, it's yeah. a perceived downgrade, yeah. as somebody, uh, somebody yeah. Uh, mentioned. Yeah. 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 And I think this is exactly the blind spot, right? The blind spot very much is that when the system was designed, it was known that it would actually be difficult to display the information in real time simply because it's a back-end calculation. And in fact, on here, I want to say also briefly that um, while I think it might be, I mean, again, I'm not an engineer, right? So, so I can't speak for them, but I suspect that the real problem is actually the buses. And the reason why the buses are the real problem is that they're all operating essentially on mobile connections, right, for internet connectivity. And so anything that, that affects the strength of that connection or whatever is going to make it impossible for the system to tell you then. then. Whereas at least for, I think, the train stations, you could probably do something about the hardware to have, uh, you know, uh, more real-time like connection. But yeah, for the buses, I, I think this is quite tricky. Lah. But, but yeah, but, but anyway, um, yeah, I think the real blind spot here, and again, a blind spot that I fully uh, suspect I would have made is that this is the technical limitation, but I think uh, as a policymaker, you might convince yourself very readily, well, uh, but why is this a problem? Because after all, the system has been very carefully designed to ensure that people don't get mischarged. That's what I would tell myself as a policymaker, right? And I also want you know, everybody to think about this. Imagine that there's a big meeting to discuss this, and this is one of the problems, right? You, you realize early on in a meeting, hey, there's a minimum amount of time that I'm going to have or lag in the system so that I just cannot give you this information in real time. Now, at that point, who's going to be the one to, to tell the senior policy makers, yeah, you know, I actually just don't trust our fair system. I just don't <laughs> trust that it will charge me correctly all the time. I really must see this and to belabor that point. I think you would be a very brave uh, you know, civil servant if you're going to bring that up because it's like saying that your colleagues uh, who are doing the, you know, the, the, the engineering for the fair system and so on, do not know what they're doing. That, that's kind of the problem. So it's a very strange thing to say in such a meeting. And I think that's where the public, of course, <laughs> needs to tell policymakers, hey, you guys are, you mean like, can you realize that not everybody thinks like you? But right. if we don't bring the public into these discussions, nobody will say that, right? And that's our right. problem here. Uh, Hold on, uh, can I just hey, sorry. jump in yeah, there? Please, yeah, please, sorry. yeah. I because... wanted to ask you something also, oh, okay, uh, Angie, before sure. I forget. Sorry, sure, sure. Uh, you, you can, uh, you can uh, state your thought uh, and then answer my question. Okay. So for you personally, was it about trust or was it just that you just wanted to say it? It's not about trust. It's not that you don't trust, but it's about convenience as somebody. It uh, is type, about yes. convenience for me. I, I, I really resent the fact that I'm made to download yet another app on my yeah. phone doing uh, one thing it, that it, EasyLink yeah. used to do. And then now I also have another app on my phone that tracks you know, my data, you know, like I have so many apps already on my phone. Do I really need another one that tracks my data? You know, and I think that, uh, you know, like it, it's really just um, the, um, the, the extra stuff that I, I just need to do basically. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. You want wanted to say something just now when I Okay, yeah, but just yes. going back to what you said, because uh, I wanted to bring this up in this conversation because you mentioned it in uh, one comment to a reader of my comic that you said oh, it's going to be really embarrassing if a civil servant brought that up, right? And then so your, so, so hold on, your, your line of thought is that, okay, you, like as this senior, like as a civil servant who has that thought, you feel embarrassed to bring it up in a meeting, therefore the normal citizens have to bring it up to the civil service but why is it that we are okay with 
civil servants feeling embarrassed to bring this up because you know like if someone in your organization already thinks that then they should have the 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 courage or whatever or, or like the safe space to bring it up without being penalized right um by whoever is who their bosses or whatever like instead of waiting for i think it's it's very much part of like design like solutions and solving the issues right why wait for the public to come in at a very late stage when you could have preempted that like way way ahead in the planning process i i agree with that but um <laughs> you know, i think uh, not not being somebody uh, who is in the uh, position to to design how the civil service has meetings uh, but you know not not only have meetings but also how uh, how we select uh, promote and i guess empower civil servants i think this is is this is actually a challenging challenging thing to do right i mean i, I think i talked also about how perhaps one of the other issues this may reveal is unfortunately the kind of uh, uh, embarrassing lack of diversity in, in policy making uh, and I think the situation here is that um, I would say, you know, it's not just about what background people come from, okay, who come into the civil service. Uh, and, and, you know, like people can believe it or not, but, you know, I, I, I didn't come from like a like super like rich background or anything like that. But that doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter because over time, because of the amount of time that I've spent, uh, you know, uh, basically not being in that situation anymore it becomes harder and harder for me and people like me to actually see things exactly the same way right. as other people do i mean you see this all the time you see uh we have any number of ministers who grew up in rental yeah, housing yeah, yeah okay yeah. but that is uh, 40 years ago <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. it's actually uh yeah it's not that easy to to keep the frame of uh, reference i think that's the issue so in the uh, so so in organizations um yeah perhaps but again you know i i'm not in a position to to say this is really how the civil service works huh? because i'm not uh, a uh, cs or anything like that but it could be possible that we don't have enough safe spaces and avenues to have true um or you know greater diversity than the civil service not just in terms of your backgrounds but also in how you think here and now uh but you know let's not have this about just me blaming others la. you know it's like it's like that la. i mean like i said i, I could have made the same mistake so yeah right so uh even in the comment section right this is such an emotive issue you know and <laughs> i've had many episodes right it's rare that we have so many comments and it seems like this one really struck a nerve and and maybe it reveals maybe it's just about the balance maybe it's also reflective of something else maybe people are thinking about elitism in policy making uh, as uh, as walter was saying and maybe there's something there but how do we interpret this should we be uh, depressed uh, at uh, based on what walter just said so this elitism this lack of uh, out of touch or should we be happy that the government has reacted to public pressure or should we say that oh this shows that the government is not as strong as before last time it would ignore uh, these kinds of public and do what is right not what is popular how how should we ng as somebody who who was complaining how do you interpret this um i interpret it as a, a very much lack of preparation i guess on their parts to anticipate problems and i think uh in design thinking when we try to like do a new system for example there would be extensive research you know not just oh we gave like cards to a thousand people i think i read in uh in an article somewhere and then they said hey that's okay you know like <laughs> and then therefore we roll out this entire system to everybody because we thought it would be okay um that's not how like rd works i think um so i think there needs to be a lot more uh, consultation a lot more um money poured into uh but who who, who is consulted also matters right actually, yeah right so it could um so like the i think the one thing that was good about when i was reading this article is that they said that okay they realized that the older people uh had issues with it which is why like the concession cards uh remained the same um and then so that was the explanation and i think that's a good thing but it's just unfortunate that they didn't like widen the study to see any other potential problem because i think uh i think what uh professor walter said in in, in the cna podcast which really struck me was he thought that uh, because it worked for him therefore it must work for everybody and um 
I think anybody who does uh, user experience will know that nothing works for everybody. It's always like a compromise where everybody is slightly unhappy about something, you know. There's no like perfect solution. If somebody, somebody's really happy about something, right, then somebody else will really hate it, right? right? So it has to be like a good compromise of all the things that everybody like can, can live with, right? right. So I, I think yeah. that has to be taken into account. Yeah. Thank you. Let, let me just read some of the messages. Sorry, I, I missed out the earlier comment. So, Masagos says, uh, not the minister, okay? Masagos, my friend, he said, <laughs> but, but, I I think the, <laughs> but I think the messaging behind the $40 million is a classic case of blaming the public for their feedback. Yeah, that was a bit strange to just insert that, you know, because of this. Uh, uh, a wild violet says, "Why is popular public sentiment not right? No, not not for me. I think it's it's okay. Being popular doesn't mean being populist, right? Um, and being popular, I mean, popular public sentiment should should matter as well. It's just that in the past, the government used to say we don't follow what's popular, like we follow what is right. So why uh, why back uh, back the backtrack uh, this time? Arun says, do you think the government have been less responsive to public sentiment on this issue?" If we were further away from a possible GE, that's a good question. Uh, my question to Arun is: Would you want the government to be less responsive, or uh, I think I think it's good that the government is responsive uh, on this particular issue, uh, in spite of the things that Angie mentioned. I think uh, what Angie mentioned is true as well. Um, honestly, uh, Liana says I also think that it's an issue that citizens are not afraid to complain about. Which is interesting, right? Because it seems like a low-hanging fruit. LTA and then Minister of Transport, you know. So it seems like it's easier for Singaporeans to be complaining about, I right? So she says, yeah, yeah. I think on. the other thing is just because it impacts you daily. Like, I think when people talk about policies and, and politics and why people don't comment on it, it, it's because you don't feel it in your right. daily life. But when like, you're tapping like in Omar, and tapping right? out, yeah. Yeah, yeah, when you're tapping in and tapping out every day and you look down and that stupid sim Simply Go logo is there instead of your fair balance, you know, it's it's like a annoyance that builds it in your heart. Right, right. Okay. <laughs> you know? I can feel yeah. your uh, your passion on this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think a lot of Singaporeans uh, are thinking like you as well. Yeah. So, Walter, did you want to respond to any of that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I just wanted to, I mean, I, I agree again, you know, that, uh, yeah, I think Simply Go worked for me. Obviously, it doesn't work for other people, but uh, I would want to point out again that there, are, there is probably quite a significant number of Singaporeans uh, who actually are very happy with the system that the way it is. And I think, uh, I think the issue there is that they just have no motivation or reason to explain to you why they like the system, right? Because for them, they take their credit cards or bank cards out of their wallet, they tap through the system, they don't think, uh, they don't think that they need to watch the system very carefully to ensure that they're charged correctly. And so for them, from their point of view, it works as well. Now, it is true, uh, maybe they would be even slightly happier if there was also a magical way for them to find out what the fares and so on are when they're doing all this. So, I mean, I, I don't dispute that. Perhaps their experience could be improved even a little more. But as it is right now, uh, for many of those users, they don't think that there's a significant deficit in the system. Now, does that mean that everybody should try and fit to the new system? No, it doesn't mean that. But uh, it does mean that if we're looking at the cost structure of the system, that is the Simply Go system as well as the existing system, um, we have to figure out some way of figuring out, of, of basically deciding what's the value of catering to people's concerns and needs, their genuine concerns and needs, versus the amount of money that we may need to spend to catering to that. And of course, at, at this point, some people might say, well, what are you talking about? This is a false choice because you didn't have to implement Simply Go. But actually, if you didn't implement Simply Go, you wouldn't be able to offer the uh, multiple payment platform convenience that Simply Go offers for about 40% of the users. You wouldn't be able to offer that, right? Those 40% of users would be forced to use a cash card system if you didn't implement it. And for that 40%, because they voluntarily are using their bank cards, I think it's reasonable for me to say that that would actually be not good for them. So, 
anyway, yeah. So how do you balance all this out? Um, maybe just one other brief thing, I think, on consultation, yeah? Yeah. Um, I think it is, uh, I completely understand why one of the triggering issues in this whole case is that there's a very short six-month period, and it didn't look as if LTA was ready for, for consultation at all. In fact, they, they didn't say anything about consultation when they announced the plans, even though we know after the fact that they did some, you know, market fencing and, and user tests and so on. But if you are going to do consultations in agency, I would say that, you actually have to do that with the view of being ready to completely change your policy or decision if uh, the consultation tells you that, you know? And I think one of the concerns here, and I think maybe one of the factors is that if you are already pretty sure that you have a reasonable technical reason for going ahead of the plan, and the reason here that you save money, people seem to be okay with and so on, right? Then you get very cautious about doing a consultation because you know secretly you're not so prepared to actually reverse course. Right. And yeah, I think that's the issue, right? So, so can we have a culture in Singapore where uh, agencies are more ready to say, we do not in fact know whether A, B, or C is the best. We have good reasons for all of them. Maybe we actually prefer A to B and C, but we're willing to put them forward to the public, tell the public why we think A is kind of better, and then see what happens. But agencies, I think, um, have a lot of caution about doing that. And I would even say that uh, some of this caution comes from the public reacting badly to these things sometimes. You know, the, the classic example I would give you is, uh, some minister says, oh, we can do A, B, and C. Which one do you want? And then the public says, hey, wait a minute, I'm paying yes, yes. you good money so that you- I was just gonna say that. Yeah, I was just gonna say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I was just gonna say yeah, can, can I just talk about the consultation yeah. part? Like I would say that um uh that bringing in consultations at a very late stage might be a problem because like you said, what if they say hey, I don't think this system works, man? And if you wasted all that sort of money and and effort yeah. that you spent to develop the system, which is why like I think consultations and user research should be brought in like way, way, way uh, like you know early in the game where it's not just about pushing through what you want. Uh, it's about looking at how people use systems and then developing solutions for that. Uh, and also, of course, integrating all the different features that you want, right? Like, uh, I mean, bringing a user research expert in at a late stage, it's kind of like just giving you points. Oh, yeah, you did everything well, you know, I think if, if that, that's the case. Yeah, so I guess there's also the, I mean, it's, there are a lot of compounding factors as well, right? And one of it is the idea that, a lot of times certain policies are made and it seems like Singaporeans are excluded from it. Uh, and when, you know, uh, Arun said, uh, I'm, I'm reading his comment in the context of the government's re recent push to be more consultative and to co-design policy, which probably requires a lot more transparency and not just communication, but dialogue between the government. Like, How often have we heard, right, when a person <laughs> goes for a, di for a dialogue with the government and then they would say, Oh, that wasn't a dialogue. That was a briefing, or what? It could just—it could be real. It could be the perception, right? But we've heard could that have been so an email. <laughs> we've heard that so many times. So I guess there is some, maybe that the culture needs to change as well. So somebody uh, writing in support of simply go handsome cat. Actually, I'm aware that fares can be deducted wrongly, but I accept that in exchange for being able to earn credit card rebates with simply go. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, Angie, a question for you. Do you think it's a win now that the government have, uh, has U-turned? Um, I think it's a win for now. Uh, I think it's a win for now because like, it, it showed certain lapses in the policies that they have been making or even the system that they have been making where you know it's very much focused on the technological and the logical stuff and they totally uh, forget about the emotional and psychological part of a u like a user's experience so i think they that's that's a really good win and hopefully that's something that they take into the future with them and they design future you know systems yeah the emotional part is always ignored in a lot of uh, these things, right? And it's it's equally, if not more important in uh, in many cases. Yeah. Yeah. So, and a, a question for Walter is this, which you sort of uh, answered uh, just now, but, but maybe you can just uh, delve a little bit deeper into this. Is this reflective of a deeper rot in the civil and public service? I think this is. Yeah, that's that's a bit strong, maybe. I don't want to be too harsh. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to be too harsh on ordinary civil servants. You know, who yeah. are, most of them just wanna 
want to serve Singapore. You know, I don't want to be too harsh uh, on them as well. But the, uh, at least maybe not deeper rot, but is it is it elit this is this elitism one o one right? Okay, uh, I, I'm going to say no to to that just just uh, straight off. And the reason why I want to say no to that is that uh, be, you know in in all the interactions that I've, I've ever had with civil servants as well as political office holders, I would say that for basically for the policies that touch our daily lives, you know, regarding it can be labor, it can be uh, housing, transport, whatever it is, uh, I, I can say very truthfully, I've never detected any hint of, you might say, duplicity or, you know, self-dealing or, or anything like that in, in the way that they formulate, think about these policies and think about, well, how do they shape the policies to serve Singaporeans? Okay, I know it sounds a bit like a campaign speech, <laughs> la, but really, uh, my experience <laughs> has been like that. And, and I think the experience of other people who have, you know, who have worked with the civil service or POHS, political office holders, on these kinds of like, you know, I say, um, like daily living policies, it, it's very much like that la, for the most part. But, I, uh, but at the same time, uh, I think when we look at the structure of how uh, the civil service operates, but now, now I want to broaden it beyond that, okay? When you look at the structure of how the government uh, operates and the political philosophy of, of, of this government, I think we have to recognize that over the, uh, over the decades, the government has spent a lot of effort to uh, basically, you might say, um, influence or manage, maybe manage is a better word, they spend a lot of effort to manage all of the feedback channels in Singapore, right? So j just think about, you know, many of the, um, many of the channels through which criticism, defend, contestation get, uh, get you know, get, get taken up in, in many democratic societies. Uh, think about unions, you know, think about the media, think about citizens' groups which form around one cause or another. In Singapore, we have to acknowledge that the government plays a significant role uh, directly or indirectly in all of these things. And is that good or bad, right? Uh, I mean, okay, I guess a lot of people here are going to say it's bad. But if you, if you take a step back, I mean, the reason why I suppose a, civil, um, a politician might say why we do it this way is because they would say something about how you know, uh, dissent is important, criticism is important, but uh, if it's not managed carefully, it could lead to destructive divisions of society, okay? So no campaign speech for me, lah, okay? But basically, that's kind of what they would say. But they would also, I think, if they're honest with themselves, they would also have to recognize that if they manage it too well, then they will never hear the genuine concerns of people, right? Because everybody down the line has a way of managing the, the criticism in this sense so that the people on top don't hear the full force of it. That's just how it is, you know? And I, I want to say something, uh, not, not in Singapore, but, but something I've heard about, which is I thought quite interesting, instructive for our experience. And everybody knows that, that China is not exactly um, super open society in terms of criticism and things like that, right? It's a lot of control, state control. But what is interesting is that uh, I've seen research that indicates that the central Chinese government is actually explicitly tolerant of local dissent and the local media. Why? Why are they tolerant about this when they actually have the, the tools to shut down a lot of this? It is because they recognize that local dissent and media play a very important role in surfacing up things which are really problematic because they know that sure as heck, everybody down the line will never tell the central government what is really going on. And maybe we should learn something from that, right? I'm not saying that we should manipulate things in that way, but I really think we could be a bit more um, open or a lot more open towards alternative ways for people to criticize, give feedback and so on, which are not occurring through the managed, you might say, channels. Okay? So, right. So, 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 this is good. Okay, so this is a win for that. Okay, maybe for that. I don't know. Right. Yeah. So, so based on that, right, so we have this uh, managed channels, right, as you eloquently put it, right. Um, so, Basically, our voices are not, uh, do not reach them. Uh, and even sometimes, even without these managed channels, right? When the MP comes over, I'm, and I think a question for all of us, when the MP comes over, how often are we as honest to them as we are uh, talking about them behind them, right? And I've seen this with my own eyes, like people who have everything, because people are just polite, they don't like these kinds of con confrontations with uh, with their MPs, right? I've seen this so many times. The moment the door closes, oh, that MP is horrible, <laughs> blah, blah. But when the MP was there, oh, so everything is nice. And then, but also, also, the other thing is, a lot of times, the MP will also just ask about constituency issues. 
That's where the direction of the conversation will go. They will not ask, oh, so what do you think about Pofma? <laughs> they won't ask, they won't ask, right? They, so they, it's, the role of the MP has also been, been scoped in such a way that constituency issues are more important, right? So I think, I think it's, can I, of course, there will be. Just, some, yeah, can please, I just please. Uh, very uncharacteristically uh, defend the MP? Okay. Because <laughs> okay, I, I don't think we have time anymore. Good night, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> At the end of the okay, <laughs> carry, on, um, but, carry on. But I would say that like uh, for MPs to bring up Kofma when I, I would say that many Singaporeans don't particularly care and I think That's a lot true. of Singaporeans when the MP comes for a house visits um, are usually talking about oh my god you know why is my, my staircase so so dirty you know like the, 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 the cleaner never come blah 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 so like right. for the MP to bring it up like I don't expect him to do it for every right, household right, right. you know because that's just insane and I think the, these sort of niche topics where like you know for, for example we are concerned about I don't think the average Singaporean is concerned about right so, but, but, but the thing is, right, I, I think be, just before that, I remember there was this, this MP visit uh, when I was in my own neighborhood. And oh, what yeah. happened, uh, uh, I, I think it was still in the same uh, okay. area. So this was in my old place. Mm -hmm. um, and before the MP even came, you know, there was an entourage of people knocking yeah. on doors, yeah. Yeah. getting you ready. And I was in my house clothes, you know? yeah. and then they told me, oh, please be ready. Uh, yeah. The MP is coming. And I'm like, you want me? Me to dress up to meet my MP. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, you see, I, I, the VIP I invited that I forgot. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, but, but, I don't like yeah. that as well, the, the entourage coming beforehand. I mean, time, it just, yeah, yeah. I think at the same time, what they do is they try to figure out if you've got any, like, bad things that you want to say. Yeah. Yeah. So they will yeah. ask you, like, uh, like, these are the volunteers, like, I assume, or the grassroots leader, where they ask you, like, Oh, um, is there any concern that you have or whatever? And they try to screen you instead of uh, just letting you do it to the MP no. directly. So, so I that's, think, yeah. That's, that's an, I think that's an instructive point, right? So, so I, by the way, I've learned my lesson already. So I'll just say, no, no everything's good. Everything's good. I, just, I, love, I love this. I love this GRC. <laughs> Japanese is the best. Yeah, yeah. So I'll just wait for the MP to come, right? Yeah. Then, uh, but, yeah. but does that filter through to all of this? So... The grassroots organizations do because the purpose of the grassroots leaders is to channel citizens' feedback to the MPs, right? But sometimes yeah. you get the impression that the grassroots leaders are shielding the MPs from yes. public feedback. Correct. Whether whether it's yeah. true, I don't know, but this is the perception, right? Is that the case in the civil service as well, based on what uh, Walter was okay. saying that maybe a junior civil servant may not wanna hear this? But that seems to me like the same mechanism you are shielding the senior civil servants from public sentiment. Would that be fair to say, Walter? No, so, so I think in, in some of the, of the discussions I've been involved in, uh, I can say that the feedback they get is, I mean, feedback that, that people get is actually reflected up. But um, I guess what I'm concerned about here is whether uh, as a civil servant, um, you're willing to, or it's in your incentive rather, to press the feedback all the way, especially if the feedback happens to be, you might say, more at odds with, I think, uh, you know, uh, what Angie pointed out to be the more technocratic uh, nature of the civil service, right? So if, if for example, if, if the point is that people uh, feel a visceral sense of discomfort with not seeing their balance, and you know, this is a visceral thing because uh, people might be, may, might be able to agree that the system a uh, high percentage of the time works accurately. So technically, there's no reason to be concerned. But nonetheless, people are genuinely concerned. But if you feed this back, and then, you know, somebody says, oh, no, but, but technically, 99.99% of the time, if it's audited, it's always correct. Are you going to keep bringing it up, you know, like a broken record in a meeting, right? Being like, no, no, I know you're telling me that. And I know I can tell the constituent or the person who gave me feedback that. But it doesn't matter. They're still very, very upset, you know? So I, I think... Um, because meetings realistically only last a certain amount of time, I think these points are made. They, they are dealt with perhaps in the way that I mentioned uh, earlier, which is some evidence shows that the concern is not such a big concern, right? And then people move on to the next agenda item. You know, even talking about the issue of affordability, I can tell you affordability almost always comes up in all these meetings. And the way that I suspect they are generally dealt with is to point out the various mechanisms that do exist for lower income Singaporeans to get transport vouchers, to get subsidies, concession, and so on. And all these mechanisms exist 
But then they don't change the fact that there are still a substantial number of people out there who still feel very stressed, right, about paying for public transport and managing every cent. And again, uh, how much do you want to belabor that point? You could raise the point again, but then people would say, but I already told you, we have all these mechanisms and you should go and communicate to the public that. So kind of ends there. Lah. And I think that's, the, that's how the cycle works sometimes. Right. And that's, where, that's why I think uh, public feedback in this raw format of social media where people are not afraid to hurl whatever the heck they want, um, that is sometimes the only way of breaking through, okay? It's, it's sometimes the only way of breaking yeah. through. Indeed, indeed. It's more effective than even the MPs coming to your house and, uh, because, for, for that reason because there's, there's no filter, right? But of course, there's, there's, there's downsides to that as well. So there's a question here, uh, Chiyun, uh, I think this is a DM. Uh, is this decision reversal unprecedented for this 3G slash 4G government? Or at least, I mean, the speed of reversal, I think it is. Would you, uh, I, 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 I cannot, I cannot. Would you yeah, count sorry, Angie? the go, go stun on 6.9, uh, one of that, with, 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 does it count? The, the oh, white interesting. Paper? Oh, that's true. The 6.9 million, I right? think, yeah, where, I think where that's the from. only one that I can think of on the fly. Um, and right. that happened in the wake of the election, right? right? Uh, um, but I, other than that, I don't really remember any major backtracking. Right. For, for this government, well, you know, I mean, we have had like very unpopular policies being uh, being reversed, right? Like graduate mother scheme, for instance. But that was that was way way back, right? Way 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 <laughs> way back. Yeah, I think NJ and I were not born yet. Walter was still in town. <laughs> Uh, back then, yeah, but <laughs> but it has happened, right? So, yeah. what is the and uh, so let's just wrap up, right? So, what what is the one takeaway for each of you, uh, from this episode? Broader, uh, bigger picture. Yeah. Wow, this is this is a, yeah, a very chim question. <laughs> uh, I think the 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 most shallow one that I would say is that sometimes complaining is- works. Is that shallow? Um, because like uh, I think they, that's the I think that's the most surface uh, one because we can directly see the result yeah. of complaining. You know, like we, we like to call Singaporeans we we like to call Singaporeans a nation of complainers. But then I think maybe we don't complain enough about right. things that really matter. And then uh, like you know now that we've seen this, maybe we should complain about GST <laughs> next. I don't know. I'll bring it back to seven <laughs> percent. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So, so that's the thing, right? I don't think that's a shallow point at all. And I think we need to constantly remind Singaporeans. So sometimes they are just, oh, what's the point of doing this? It won't matter. No, it does. It does matter, voice. right? You have a voice, right? And and pe- uh, people say, the guy, oh, uh, I'm not sure, you know, I, I'm so afraid that the government monitors social media. Well, I hope they do, right? Any good government should be monitoring social media, right? Uh, to uh, to take into account public sentiment. So yeah, I don't think that's a shallow point. I think that's actually a deep point that a lot of Singaporeans uh, do not emphasize. I think that the, our voice matters. The other point that I well, it's not a point, but I guess it's more like a realization for myself is how deeply technical um, Singapore is as an as a as a, as a in a in terms of policy making, because. Um, I just realized that many many times like that emotional and, and, and experiential right. part is, is completely just like not even in the conversation at right. all. Right. Um, and that is quite interesting to me because for in my line of work, experience is uh, the, one of the most important things, right? right. Um, and, and you want your, the people who use your products or you know, buy your things to love the thing that you're doing. Right. Um, and, and so to see the, the real lack of it in policy making uh, is very interesting for me and also just to see like how you know even if we tell you hey this sucks and then they're like oh but it's better it's better <laughs> <laughs> yeah we know it's better like technically but you know we don't feel like it's better whose voice, like, it's just a very... that? whose voice is that <laughs> <laughs> i leave it i leave it to you to decide but, but it's just right, interesting right. for me to see that sort of uh i guess like uh, dissonance between right. the the feeling and then the logic part of yeah. it. Yeah, I think I yeah. think that's that's such an excellent point. Like the feeling part is is something that policymakers always have to ha- uh, has to uh, take into account, right? A politician has to take that into account. Uh, Walter. Hmm. Uh, 
Uh, so for, for me, I think I'm going to uh, bring up a point which I think Sun Sun brought up, uh, you know, just quite recently, yeah. which is on the whole issue of trust. But I think I, I will broaden it a bit because my understanding was that she was a um, bit more focused perhaps on this issue of trust in the transaction, right, the transaction level there, uh, when you tap out, or, you know, and you see the balance and so on. But I think what this episode exposed for me is that the trust that we have in government uh, is actually sometimes quite fragile, right? Uh, and the reason why it's quite fragile is that uh, basically, when you look at the situation, what contributed, I think, to the lack of trust was the very short time frame between the announcement being made and, you know, basically transition was supposed to happen. It was, of course, the fact that the way that Simply Go System is designed is that, uh, and we've seen this clearly in our discussion, it, it caters to people who already have an extremely high existing level of trust in the system in the fair computation system or who are rich enough that you don't give a damn okay so that's who it caters for and yes we see very clearly now that for people who do not have that level of trust or uh who have more concerns about their balances managing it and so on how could they be expected to actually trust the system as currently designed due to the lag inherent issues in the system and so on right so you lose trust because of that but i think it's the combination of the time frame the sense that I don't get the trust level that I want from the system. And, you know, perhaps also, I think, uh, and, and we also can't, I think, escape the fact that uh, this is about public transport fares and public transport fares have been going up. Uh, cost of living has been going up. All of these factors together, I think, make a number of people, including people who are not really affected by Simply Go, right? It made a number of people start questioning, well, uh, can I really trust that all right. the government agencies are doing the right thing at all times in my own interest? And some people started doubting that, right? More people started or, doubting that. Or, that's or, Walter, the and Walter so is, it, yeah. is it a lack of trust in the competence of the government, which mm. is sort of new, mm. which in the yeah. past, in the past, yeah. we never saw these kinds of criticisms against mm. the government, right? Like people yeah. will say the government uh, elitist out of touch, but you've you've never heard people criticize the government for being incompetent, and this is sort of something new yeah. in the past few years. Would you say that's uh, that's part of it as well? Yeah, so, so I think that's interesting because I think it's good and bad. Uh, I, I think the good thing about it, of course, is that people should feel empowered to criticize the government on competency grounds. And I think it is also the case today, unlike maybe what, 40 or 50 years ago, uh, that you can find a large number of experts uh, you know, out in the public who are not aligned with the government, who know a lot about the subject, perhaps more than you know a lot of people within government and who can provide uh, extremely well-founded critiques of these issues. Right? So, I think uh, it's, it's a good thing from that point of view. Um, is it bad? I mean, I, I, think, um, I think the bad issue would be this, right? I think the bad issue is if we don't have a way within our political system, within our decision-making system, to actually uh, accommodate uh, these kinds of critiques of competency and so on in a way that actually leads to better policy making. So that, that's, that would be my main concern, right? Because when I think about bringing it back to Simply Go, um, in the end, was the way that this transition was handled and the eventual U-turn by government, was that an example of good policy making? Maybe not, right? Because it was certainly a decision that tried to stem, I think, the erosion of trust and the accusations of lack of competence. So from the political point of view, it probably did that successfully. But from the policy making point of view, because it results in $40 million of unnecessary expenditure and because some of the fundamental issues, for me, the most important would be, well, guess what? Uh, low-income people who have difficulty in public transport still have difficulty today. No different from last week, okay? And the other issue, of course, is people who don't get the balance feedback still don't get it. So, yeah, so those issues have not been <laughs> yes. solved. And, 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 and there's no timeline, right, for, for solving this. And, and, and there's no announcement of, oh, you know, we hear the concerns here and we, we got to start looking at them. And it's not as if we can solve them tomorrow, but here's the, the roadmap or something. Well, yeah, there's not much indication that this kind of thing is going on. So, uh, although, you know, I mean, I don't want to be unfair, right? Maybe it is going on. Maybe there's a super secret task force. Like, okay? <laughs> but, um, but yeah, but, but my point is, there's got to be a way of, uh, of allowing these voices on criticism for competency to be folded in, not in a way they co-opt them, like, okay? But for a way for us to manage all of this so that we get genuinely better policy making. And if we don't have that, then this is actually not great. Like, it's just a waste of everybody's time. So... Yeah, right. we, we need better policy. Okay. Right? Thank you. That was that was excellent. So so three takeaways, right? Uh so don't 
complaining works, emotions matter in policy making, and trust is fragile. And I think uh, probably the government has, uh, I, I, I'm sure they have realized <laughs> that before this, but I think this episode has sort of heightened that uh, a bit. And if I could add one more, we don't need apps for everything. Yes. I don't need more yes. apps. Like, can I just go to the website and yeah. do it for a one-time transaction? Yeah. I don't need to download an app every single time. I really, yeah. do, really <laughs> hate downloading apps. Oh you my know? god, like, don't don't get me started about scanning menus. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, that's a... That's a yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like the QR... I scan the QR code menu QR and I have to pay like 10% service charge. What kind of rubbish Yeah, yeah. So, so, so that's, that's a separate conversation. But thank you so much, Walter. Thank, thank you, Andy for being so sporting and I would also like to offer my services uh, in the future conflict mediation okay. services services <laughs> 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 for any, anybody else but thank you so much for being okay. sporting and I think it was an excellent conversation just, thank you guys so I just want to thank yes, uh, Walter as well for being very very sporting about the he was, thing, he was. Know, like the, the yeah. comic and, and stuff so thank you so yeah. much yeah. Thank <laughs> you. no no I, 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 want, yeah. I want to thank people for pointing out when I'm full of shit <laughs> Very helpful. <laughs> oh, this is this is such a love fest. Okay. Everybody's it's thanking each other. <laughs> so wonderful. No, uh, yeah. but uh, but I think it's also important for us to model this, right? To model yeah. that we can have these sorts of agreements in public, you know, and nothing's gonna happen. You know, we can all joke about it, we can laugh, and yet we can be serious. At, well, at, if you see, if you don't see me posting in the next week, I don't know if I'm like, I don't know. Like, so sometimes <laughs> I think things happen to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Good night, everyone. Yep. Thank you so much. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.